Welcome to Operating Systems. In our last lecture, we talked about general scheduling approaches, mostly for uniprocessor general purpose systems. And now, in this lecture, we are going to talk about specialized per, uh, scheduling approaches for real-time systems. So, what's a real-time computer system? Now, this can be defined uh, as follows by Hermann Kopetz, one of the uh, well earliest uh, researchers uh, doing intensive work in formal analysis of real-time systems. And Kopetz uh, defines a real-time system as follows. A real-time computer system is a computer system in which the correctness of the system behavior depends not only on the logical results of the computations, but also on the physical instant at which these instants are produced. So in contrast to your general purpose computing where a task might take longer or might take not as long, and this depends on many circumstances, in a real-time system you usually have an embedded systems context that means we are controlling something. And if we're controlling something, uh, this something might be moving in the physical environment like a robot. And if we control this robot too late, so we, uh, for example, have sensors that would uh, keep a robot from falling down a cliff and we would read these sensors too late and our robot would move on over the cliff, obviously, then we have a problem. So real-time systems really need to pro not only provide correct answers, but they need to provide correct answers on time. And accordingly, we need different approaches to scheduling. And this is what this lecture is all about. So one example for a typical embedded systems use case is the so-called inverted pendulum. So you have a mobile platform, like just uh, whatever, a platform on four wheels. And this platform on four wheels can be moved by a motor forward and backward. And on this platform, there's, a, well, just a rod or something made of maybe metal. And this rod should actually stay vertical. So this is why it's called an inverted pendulum, because it can move over here and over here. And our objective here is that our rod always is vertical to our platform, so that the, the angle here is zero. So in order to determine the angle of this rod, we need a sensor here to measure the angle of this rod. And, well... Uh, according to the sensor value readings, we need to move the platform in order to keep it uh, orthogonal to the platform. So what we need to do is we need to provide the sensor me measurements, so-called stimuli, to a real-time computer system. Then the real-time computer system calculates which reaction is required to whatever is happening and reacts to this by starting the motor and moving in one or the other direction. Now, what can happen to such a system? Some external disturbance. So, for example, I just move this platform around accordingly. Uh, the rod uh, mounted to the platform will move, so we'll have to counteract in order to keep it vertical. And the reaction time of a computer system, uh, so the time passing between the stimulus is received and the reaction is initiated here, and also the variation of this reaction time, which we also call jitter, should be minimized in such a real-time computing application. So in order to figure out uh, when a response to some stimulus is on time, we define deadlines. So these deadlines are in most cases defined by the technical system to be controlled. So for example, by the uh, speed in which a system can move or break or something like that. And we can classify deadlines as follows. First, we have soft deadlines. Soft deadlines means that we calculate some sort of result uh, as usually uh, the uh, yeah, a consequence of some external stimuli. And the obtained result, so the reaction of our system, might even be useful even if it was obtained after the deadline is passed. So for example, you might have something like a video decoder. So usually you play a video with, for example, 60 frames per second. And now if one of these frames takes a bit longer to decode, it might still be useful to display that frame. So you have a bit of jitter in this because you have to wait a bit longer for your frame to arrive, but you can still see the picture. In addition, you can have firm deadlines. Firm deadlines means uh, if you calculate the result, but you only finish calculating it after your deadline has passed, 
Well, it's useless, so you have to throw it away because you can't use it anymore, but there is no bad consequences from this. And finally, there's hard deadlines. So for hard deadlines, if the deadline passes without a system reaction, damage can occur. For example, our robot falling down a cliff because our system took too long to decide to break uh, as uh, the reaction to some sensor input. And a real-time system overall is considered hard if at least one of its deadlines is hard. Otherwise, we describe a real-time system as being soft. So for real time systems which are hard real-time systems, it has to be guaranteed that all of the deadlines are kept and this in turn requires to use different development approaches that were compared for usual desktop or server computing and also different structures of our computing system on the hard and software side. So one important question is of course, can we actually figure out how long it takes to obtain a reaction from an input? And we can generalize this question and ask ourselves, how long does a program run? For example, from start, which we would just assume would be uh, the provision of the input, to the end, which would be the generation of our output. Now, runtimes of programs vary, and these uh, variations uh, occur to, due to a number of different uh, circumstances here. So one of the obvious things is that a program can have a different input, like we input a number and we have a program just doing as many loop iterations as the input uh, was, to uh, was telling the program. So obviously the larger our number on the input, the longer our program runs. But it can also depend on hardware states when the program starts, for example, if any values are already in cache or not. And uh, programs can also be delayed by interrupts. So if an interrupt occurs regularly, uh, it takes time to process on a single processor system, so this time is not available for executing our program. So our program takes longer overall uh, to finish. Uh, process switching can happen, or even power management that shuts down a processor or just reduces the clock of a processor. And if you look at the distribution of possible execution times, you have a best case execution time, so that's the absolute shortest time that a program a given program can run and then you have some variation here so uh, this is a, a distribution here and then you have a worst case execution time which is the absolute largest execution time that a program can have now we're mostly interested in the worst case execution time here so the longest time a program can run because if we can ensure that this longest time is shorter than the time that uh, we need to react uh, then of course we are on the safe side so this worst case execution time is especially relevant. Now, uh, the problem with the worst case execution time is that it's very difficult to determine this worst case execution time precisely because you have so many different things that can influence this worst case execution time. So what we do is we try to obtain a safe upper bound, a so-called estimate for our worst case execution time. And this worst case execution time estimation has to be guaranteed larger or equal to the worst case execution time. So in the worst case, we uh, just uh, yeah, over approximate uh, the value here, which means we're on the safe side because we assume that our program would always take longer than it actually does in the worst case. Now, however, of course, the difference between the real largest worst case execution time and the estimate for this should be too big because otherwise we would waste quite a number of resources. And the real-time analysis community calls this the worst case execution time estimation should be tightly bounded. So how does such an event look uh, for initiating a computation? So we call these triggers and a trigger is something that initiates a computation and we just call this computation a task in real-time systems and we have different ways to initiate computation. One way is uh, to do it in an event triggered way. So uh, we have sensor readings here and these sensors generate, for example, interrupts to our system. And whenever our interrupt handler detects a relevant change of the state of the controlled object, so a sensor value that goes above or below a defined uh, value or something like this, then this is an event and this event then kicks off a task, so the task is started 
Uh, this means that we schedule our tasks at runtime because we cannot predict when our event will arrive. So essentially we have to start a task as a reaction of an event coming in, which means we have high overhead for tests under high load and the behavior of our system might be difficult to predict because we can have all sorts of times for events arriving or if we have multiple events, we can have events arriving in different orders or at the same time. So all of these cause problems. So event triggered real-time systems are uh, mostly used for soft real-time system applications. Another way to trigger computations is to trigger them by the real time that has passed. So for a time-triggered real-time system, we define fixed points in time at which we execute calculations and we can plan them in advance. So this is what we call offline scheduling and in almost all cases the execution of these tasks is then periodic. So we define a certain schedule here over a certain amount of time and after this time is over we start with our schedule from the beginning. For this, usually resource utilization is higher than with the event triggered system because the calculation of these schedules always has to consider this worst case execution time. And as we've seen, we can only estimate an upper bound for this worst case execution time, which is usually really larger than the worst case execution time. So we might waste a bit of time because of the assumptions we have to make here. Now, time-triggered real-time systems have a comparatively high energy consumption, so they cannot sleep compared to an event-driven system, which doesn't have to do anything as long as no event comes in. So we have a relatively high energy consumption because the system is permanently scheduling, something is permanently active, but in turn, it needs a lower test effort. It's more predictable, and we can actually provide some guarantees for the timeliness of our system. So that's why time-triggered real-time systems are used for hard real-time system applications where a failure of uh, providing a result on time might have fatal consequences for our system. So what's the relation to operating systems here? Now there are a really large number of operating systems for embedded systems and most of them have some sort of real-time functionality and if you count, you can find more than 500 different real-time operating systems for different architectures, open source, closed source, from so many companies out there. Uh, one operating system uh, standard actually that has uh, proliferated in the automotive sector is the OSEC standard. And there's an OSEC Time OS. The OSEC Time OS is used for safe realization of what we call X by wire applications. For example, in an airplane or helicopter, you might have fly by wire. So your steering rod of your airplane is no longer physically connected to your uh, actuators in your system, but there's only a data connection. And this data connection, of course, has to be on time. So we have to guarantee timely connections from our steering to the reaction of our airplane and it has to be reliable. And the same uh, is experimented with in cars already. So we have steer by wheel. So the steering wheel has no direct physical connection to the axle of your car anymore. You can have brake by wire or electronic uh, gas, uh, which means uh, that your, your uh, accelerator pedal is also just a digital sensor reading, which then controls the properties of your motor, if it's a combustion engine or an electric engine. So OSIC time provides guaranteed predictable behavior. It supports time-triggered applications. So there's different specifications like the OSIC time operating system specification. And uh, it can also provide the global coordination of what we call embedded control units. So these are all the small computers in your car that control single parts of the functionality of your car, which means you can also provide a global time in your system. And again, there's another specification for this. So uh, there's uh, so many standards for this and there's so many applications. So if you're interested, OSEC time is an interesting example to look at. So how does scheduling in OSEC time work? Now OSEC time provides offline scheduling. Offline scheduling means we determine the points in time when a task is initiated and then accordingly when it's ending, because we know the runtime, the worst case execution time, and design time. So before we actually ship this system to a customer, so at our system design software writing compile time uh, stage. 
And this offline scheduling produces a so-called dispatch table, and this dispatch table controls the periodic activation of tasks. So what you see here on the, uh, the x-axis in our diagram is a time that progresses like in microseconds here. And this time is split in periods of identical length. So here is period one, here is period two, and so on. And you can see the relative order and the relative starting points of all the tasks inside of each peri period is identical to each other. So essentially we only need to provide a schedule for one single period and then have to ensure that the schedule is interpreted from scratch for all the upcoming periods here. And so such a dispatch table could look like the following. We would dispatch uh, task 1 at 1000 microseconds, task 2 at 3000, task 3 at 4000 and task 1 again here at 5000 microseconds and then we reset our relative clock to zero with the start of the next period and would start t1 again here, t2, t3 and t1 over here. So this dispatch table here is uh, just a simple example obviously in real life these can get more complicated and a complete pass through our table here so going from the first to the last task here is also called a dispatch around because after this dispatch around is finished we just start reading our table from the beginning. So our dispatcher here is invoked by a timer interrupt because it has to be activated at certain times. So for example, if we have a timer interrupt every millisecond here, so every 1000 microseconds, we could control the starting of each tasks if they're always on multiples of 1000 microseconds. What is important is that only the dispatcher can activate tasks, so there's no other functionality to start a task. So the dispatcher has complete control over what's running on the CPU and over the time distribution. And there's a safety mechanism here, which is called deadline monitoring, so it can be checked if a process has actually terminated when the next process is to be started. Now this offline scheduling may be a more complex uh, task to fulfill, in case of yeah, real-world software systems, so in the real world there are tools to support developers, like a graphical tool here, to schedule tasks and to figure out which tasks fit in your timeline here. So again, like in our diagram of the previous slide, you have a timeline here, you can schedule tasks here at certain points in time, and then you have certain validations to figure out if anything is wrong or if everything is consistent. So this is an example of a tool which is called TimeCore. So the most relevant functionality in our real-time operating system is real-time scheduling and the objective of real-time scheduling is to obtain a guarantee that hard deadlines are kept. And uh, to take a closer look at scheduling approaches we can first take a look at the taxonomy of scheduling approaches. So we can split real-time scheduling approaches into hard deadline scheduling and scheduling for soft real-time systems. And here we only consider hard real-time systems, they're the more complex ones. And hard deadlines can be periodic, so we have something that occurs every second, for example, or they can be aperiodic, and for each of the periodic or aperiodic deadlines, we can use schedulers that are preemptive, so they can actually remove a process from the CPU and put another process on the CPU, even when that first process was still running, so uh, we can switch between processes here, or there can be non-preemptive processes, the same for aperiodic, and each of these approaches, again, no matter if preemptive or non-preemptive, can be static, so designed at design time, compile time, or it can be dynamic, which means scheduling decisions are taken at runtime. So the first scheduling algorithm we are going to investigate in depth is, so, uh, is called rate monotonic scheduling. So rate monotonic scheduling is a hard real-time scheduling approach for periodic tasks with a preemption and dynamic uh, scheduling at runtime. So this scheduler works at runtime, but still it uses fixed priorities in order to determine in which order a process uh, is actually uh, assigned the CPU. Rate monotonic scheduling is already quite old, so it was already described in 1973 by Liu and Leyland. And for rate monotonic scheduling to work, a system has to fulfill a number of conditions. We call them the assumptions for rate monotonic scheduling. The first one is that we can preempt all of our tasks at any time. So 
uh, uh, there is no uh, whatever uh, yeah disabling of interrupts or something by a task so they can be preempted whenever the operating system decides they need to be preempted and we also need to assume that the costs for this preemption so the duration of switching between one process and another are negligible compared to the runtime of our processes our second assumption is that we only consider the compute time, so the CPU time, as a relevant resource here. So we are not considering the overhead for memory accesses or I.O. accesses or other resources in our rate monotonic scheduling. The third assumption is an important one, and this is the assumption that all tasks are independent of each other, so that there is no required order of execution between tasks. So what we've seen previously, that one task would actually generate data for another task. So this other task would have to wait for the first one. Uh, this assumption should not hold for rate monotonic because otherwise this would restrict our scheduling possibilities. Our fourth assumption is that all tasks are periodic. So we only define a schedule for one period and then this period repeats over and over again. And finally, we have an assumption that the relative deadline of a task is equal to its period to make uh, the analysis easier. So one example for, uh, in which we could use rate monotonic scheduling is a car headlight controller. So this is a car headline we had in a lab back in Germany, uh, which is used in this nice car over here, for example. And this is quite a sophisticated headline. So it doesn't only have blinkers and several LED headlights, but in addition, it uh, has curve lights, so it actually can move the lights according to where you're steering to. So you're actually not only illuminating the area in front of your car, but you're illuminating in the direction in which you are driving. And in such a car headlight controller, everything can be made periodic. So for uh, these tasks here, uh, we just define each, tasks, uh, each task as something we call tau with an index i for a task number. And for these, we define the worst case execution time for this task c and the period for this task t. Uh, so these are known properties, but we don't know the phase. So we don't know at which point in a period actually our task is initiated. And we have different tasks here and different requirements in our car headlight controller. So for example, if we want to blink our indicators here, we have a worst case execution time of one. So again, we're not using absolute physical time units, but only yeah, abstract time units. And we need to blink with a period of maybe half a second here, so maybe 500. But as I said, these are not physical units, so this could also be like uh, 500 times two milliseconds or something like this. Now, uh, then we have different things going on. So to move our lights in the direction where uh, our car is driving, we need a stepper motor control for the embedded motors in our uh, headlights here. So these also have a short worst case execution time of one and a, a relatively short period of five because we need to react quickly to changes in the steering of our car. In addition, we uh, can control uh, our headlight here using different components of our system. So for example, our light actually has to know uh, in which way our uh, wheels are standing, so in which way our car is, in which direction our car is driving. So uh, we receive control messages. So this reception of control messages has a worst case execution time of two and a period of 10. And we also receive network mess mess uh, messages with a, a worst case execution time of four and a period of 50. And these can go in both directions. And finally, our headlight can return status messages, which take a worst case execution time of two units every 20 units. So this is not just a stupid, simple headlight, but there's lots of electronics involved in order to actually realize the functionality of this. And all of the components in our car system are connected by a bus system. And this is a so-called CAN bus, controller area network bus, which is very ubiquitous in well all modern cars uh, you can buy today. So for rate monotonic scheduling, the algorithm is actually relatively simple. So in rate monotonic scheduling, you define a priority. So a task with the highest priority is actually selected first. And the priority of a task grows monotonously with 
its event rate, so its frequency. This means that tasks with a short period get a high priority because they have a high danger of, well, running out of time. And a task with a high priority preempts all of our the other tasks with lower priority. So in our example for our headlight here, we can define such a so-called Gantt diagram. And here we assume that the face of all our tasks is zero, so they can just arrive as, uh, at the start of each period here. So we have our five tasks here, our motor control task, our control message task, our status task, our management task, and finally blinking the indicator here with our different periods. And we see these are time units here. So for our motor here, the deadline is every five milliseconds here, but it only executes for one millisecond, so it, the green uh, rectangle here. And then again, it executes for one time unit every five and so on and so forth. Since our motor has the uh, highest frequency, so the highest event rate, it also has the highest priority. So it's chosen first whenever a scheduling decision has to be made, in this case, every a millisecond, for example, here. The next uh, highest frequency is our control task with every 10 milliseconds, so its deadline is here. It runs for two units here. Um, then we have our status task with uh, 20 milliseconds here, so its deadline is here, so we have to schedule it here. And all the other tasks have so large uh, yeah, deadlines or uh, essentially uh, event timeouts that we cannot display them completely here. So management is every 50 milliseconds and your indicator is every 500 milliseconds. So what happens now is that whenever we have a scheduling decision, we first choose the task with the highest priority. So here we choose our motor task here. Uh, this motor task is finished after one time unit after one millisecond. So then our control task can start and then our status task can start. And now for our motor here, the next uh, uh, round has started here. So we can now schedule our motor again because our motor needs to be running again. And only when the motor has finished running, well, our control doesn't need to run. It has already finished in that period here, our status also. So then the next uh, lower priority, our management can run. Then we have an interference of the motor and control again. And finally, our indicator can actually blink. So uh, this is a very simple approach and accordingly it requires not that much support from the operating system. So if you want to implement a, a rate monitoring scheduling approach, this requires only an operating system with a preemptive fixed priority scheduler. So before we can actually employ such a rate monotonic scheduling approach, of course, we need to ensure that all the deadlines are kept for all tasks because we're considering a hard real-time system. So what we have to perform here is a sort of schedulability analysis. And uh, the schedulability analysis only works if all tasks are completely time triggered. Uh, in our example, they are. And the only variance we have is that the faces might have arbitrary values. So a necessary condition for a rate monotonic system to be schedulable, so to keep all the deadlines guaranteed, is that the utilization uh, U of our system is less than or equal to one. So we don't try to spend more compute time that's, than it's available here. So the assumption here is we have a single processor, so U is our system load, M is the number of tasks in our system. And so for each task, we create uh, the uh, fraction of its worst case execution time uh, of its own period. So for example, our motor task had one millisecond of worst case execution time in a period of five. So this would be one over five or 0.2. And then we sum this relation over all the tasks. And we know that our utilization, uh, when our utilization is less than or equal to one, we don't try to use more CPU time than would be available. So this is a necessary condition that must hold for a rate monotonic schedule to work. So for example, with the tasks we've seen here, so we have our task one with worst case execution time of one and a period of five, task two with two and 20 and so on. We would uh, then just calculate one over five plus two over 20 plus two over 10 plus four over 50 plus one over 500. We sum these together and then we arrive at a number which is 0.582. This is obviously less or equal than one. So 
we know that we don't try to use more CPU time than what is available. Now the question is, this is a necessary condition, is this actually also already sufficient to know that we can always keep all the deadlines or do we need uh, additional conditions to ensure this? Now in order to figure this out we can use a rule and this is a so-called 70% rule. And this rule for rate monotonic scheduling says that no deadline violations occur if the following conditions for our processes hold. And this condition is that the utilization of a system must be less or equal than the number of processes m or number of tasks multiplied by 2 to the power of 1 over m so the mth root of 2 minus 1. So for large values of m this converges against the uh, logarithm of 2, which is about 0.6931, so around 70%. So if this condition holds, we know that a rate monotonic scheduled system can not produce deadline violations. This is a very simple test and has a low overhead. And um, for example, uh, when we have a system with a utilization of 58.2% and five tasks, we uh, can calculate that m times 2 uh, to the power of n, 1 over m minus 1 is 74.35%. Uh, our condition is fulfilled, so we have no deadline violation here. But uh, for this other example here, example 2, uh, we see that uh, if we change our task 1 to use 2 time units in its period of 5 instead of 1 time unit, we would have a utilization of 78.2% with five tasks. So accordingly, our M is again 74.35%. So essentially, our utilization is higher than our formula, uh, than what our formula results in. So this condition is not fulfilled. Now, if this condition is not fulfilled, it does not automatically mean that we must have a deadline violation, but it means that we can have a deadline violation, so the deadline violation is possible in the system. Uh, so we have no conclusion if the condition is not fulfilled, it could still work, but on the other hand if this condition is fulfilled, so if our utilization is lower than the value we calculated here, then we definitely know no deadline violations will occur in our system. So we see that for analyzing such a system, we need sufficient and necessary condition. So if sufficient condition is positive, so uh, for example, our utilization is less than or equal than our formula on the right hand side, depending on the number of tasks. And if this condition is positive, then we know our schedule is valid. So we have schedulability tests where we have a clear answer that we know it's a valid schedule here. And uh, on the other hand, uh, there are necessary conditions. These are negative conditions. For example, if the utilization of less or equal than one does not hold, we definitely know our schedule is invalid. So uh, we know, uh, well, uh, essentially we always have deadline misses. So we have a certain space in our scheduling uh, where we definitely know we have invalid schedules here with a result where the necessary condition doesn't hold. But there's this area in between where the necessary condition holds but the sufficient condition doesn't hold and this is some sort of a gray area as we've seen before so we would need better schedulability tests to figure out for schedules in this area if they actually would work so they never produce any deadline misses or not and this uh, essentially depends on the increasing complexity of the task set. So for very simple task sets, this is easy to figure out. For very complex task sets, it usually fails because you uh, violate this assumption here. But for many interesting cases in between, you might be in this question mark area here where we would need better schedulability tests than a simple test we have provided here. So the ideal test we want to have is an exact test which means we have a sufficient and necessary condition uh, which we can check for. So one exact test uh, is response time analysis. So uh, response time analysis checks that for all of our tasks here, the response time of the task is less or equal than its period here. This is necessary and at the same time a sufficient condition here. So if the response time for uh, a task I is less than or equal to the period of that task, all the deadlines are kept. And for the largest possible delay, so our phase for this task here, uh, 
we assume that all higher priority tasks are ready at the start of our period here. So we have a schedule again, for example, now with two tasks. And we see that the first task has a response time of 12 here. Then we have a response time of 11 here. And here we have a response time of 10. So we calculate the response time by uh, looking at the worst case execution time of a task plus all the interferences. So delays called by task with higher priority. So for example, uh, here or here. And uh, essentially then we calculate the sum over all the tasks with a higher priority here and the upper integer. So then round it up to the next integer of the relation of their response time to our period here. So uh, multiplied with uh, the tasks uh, worst case execution time. So this would calculate our response time because we know it's dependent on all the interruptions we have because some other processes come in and then of the higher prioritized tasks because they have to finish earlier. So obviously that's not a simple calculation to do. Uh, so we can uh, still provide a solution using an iterative approach. So we can calculate the response time for a task using a method we call fixed point iteration. And this fixed point iteration process actually terminates if the uh, response time uh, for the nth uh, iteration here is equal to the previous one or if it is larger than the period of that task. So with this iteration, we always update our response times here for a task i for our next round n plus one to be equal to the worst case execution time of that task plus the sum of overall higher prioritized tasks of their periods. And this period length div uh, divides our response time requirement of our current iteration. Then we round this up to the nearest integer and multiply it with the worst case execution time of the higher prioritized tasks. We can also write this as pseudocode. So for each task tau i, we can actually set our r to i plus the worst case execution time. And then if our r is larger than our period, then we have a deadline violation. Otherwise, we update our i here to be our sum from our formula here. And we do this as long as i plus our worst case execution time is larger than our response time. And only if we finish this for each task here uh, over our loop, then we know that all deadlines are kept so we can return a true from our function. So another property of rate monotonic scheduling we can show is that rate monotonic scheduling is optimal. So for showing this, we need to show that rate monotonic scheduling is an optimal scheduling algorithm for fixed priorities. And this means if any other scheduling algorithm can find a valid schedule for a given scheduling problem, rate monotonic schedule will also find a valid schedule. And we do a proof by contradiction here. So we assume that some other algorithm A finds a valid schedule, but rate monotonic scheduling does not find a valid schedule. So this means in schedule A that the priority of a task I is equal to the priority of another task J plus one, and that the period of task I is larger than the period of task J. So we assume this because this is a difference to rate monotonic scheduling. So any scheduling approach that is not rate monotonic scheduling would have to differ in this respect. So we know that CI plus CJ, so the uh, is, uh, addition of both worst execution times is less than or equal the period of J. This actually still holds because we know we have a valid schedule. That was our assumption here in the beginning that our algorithm A has a valid schedule. And we know that tau i has a higher priority here because that was our assumption here. So we have a situation like this. We have a task tau i here with a higher priority, but a longer period here compared to a task tj, which we assigned as a lower priority, uh, but it has a shorter period here. So essentially, if we have a valid schedule here, if we found one here, uh, then this is a valid schedule. Now we have to show that rate monotonic scheduling can also provide a schedule for this problem. 
So we can now look at what happens when we just swap the priorities of only these two tasks here. So we swap task ti and tj around. So we go from this here, which was our algorithm A, to that here. Now then tj can be scheduled, obviously, because it has the higher priority. And ti can also still be scheduled since this condition now still holds, because now the sum of our worst case execution time is still less than or equal to tj which is less than our original condition ti. So essentially swapping these tasks around actually generated another valid schedule for our scheduling problem. And if we apply a finite number of these swaps, we actually convert our schedule A that was different to rate monotonic uh, in a finite number of steps to a rate monotonic schedule. So uh, by this construction we've seen on the previous slide, we know this is also a valid schedule in our system. So this is a contradiction to our approach here. So this means in turn that rate monotonic scheduling is an optimal scheduling algorithm. So whenever there's a valid schedule that can be found by any algorithm, rate monotonic scheduling can also find it. So we won't go into too many details on different scheduling approaches, so let's just conclude about rate monotonic scheduling. We've seen it's easy to apply and it's an optimal algorithm if we have fixed priorities. And this means the operating system can be relatively simple. It only needs to provide a scheduler that assigns fixed priorities to tasks. They don't have to be changed at runtime and so on. So this is relatively simple. We have a, a solid mathematical approach, this response time analysis, and this enables an exact schedulability test, though we even have our rule of sum 70% rule, which might uh, be the easier case for, for our simple scheduling situations here. Uh, having an exact schedulability test is important for hard real-time systems because it provides a mathematical guarantee, so a proof that we never miss a deadline here. And as I said, in many cases, the 70% rule is sufficient because if we know the 70% rule holds, then our system is schedulable. But of course, if you want to use rate monotonic scheduling, you always have to ensure that all the assumptions from the start, uh, number one to five, hold. So we have a uniprocessor system, we have no task dependencies, and so on. The other problem with rate monotonic scheduling is that rate monotonic scheduling relies on the estimation of worst case execution time. This is simple for relatively primitive microcontrollers like an 8-bit AVR controller and gets much more complicated for processes with superscalar execution, different levels of memory hierarchy, so different caches, branch prediction, and so on. So memory hierarchies, out-of-order execution, DRAM access times, all these parameters actually make the worst case execution time much harder to predict. So our estimates may be worse off. So essentially we would have to waste more time for the 70% rule predictability because this is based on worst case execution times in order to ensure that our system is schedulable. And in any case, we need to ensure that we analyze the complete system. So not only a subset of tasks that are available. So before we finish today's lecture, we'll take a look at another scheduling approach for real-time systems, and this is called earliest deadline first. So earliest deadline first is uh, as rate monitoring scheduling, a real-time scheduling approach for hard deadlines. This can consider periodic as well as aperiodic tasks. It's a preemptive approach and it uses dynamic priorities here. So priorities are here assigned at runtime and not statically at system design time. So for earliest deadline first, all the tasks which are ready to run are sorted in order of their absolute deadlines. Though in reality, we will use relative deadlines to specify them. Uh, if the first task in a list has an earlier deadline than the currently running task, then EDF performs preemption. So the running task is preempted immediately. So let's take a look at this example here. We have three processes here and they arrive at certain times. So they're ready to run at certain times. And these are absolute times now here. So this process one arrives at time zero, process two arrives at time four, process three arrives at time five. And they have CPU and IO bursts and certain deadlines which they have to keep. So process one uh, has to do calculations for 10 cycles here and has an IO burst of three cycles and an overall deadline of 33 time units. Whereas process two 
uh, calculates for three units, has an IO burst of five time units and a deadline of 24, and process three has a CPU burst again of 10 units, a variable IO burst of three to five, depending on whatever is happening, and a deadline of 24. And so we could find a schedule here, and uh, we know that the order of the absolute deadlines is important. So what happens here at the beginning, our system only has one task at time zero, so this task can execute on its own until no other task arrives. Now, this task has a deadline of 33, so whenever another task arrives with a lower deadline, our task one, process one, is preempted. And that's what happens at point in time four here. So our process two arrives, this has a lower absolute deadline here, so it has to be finished at 24 instead of 33, so it's more urgent to run this. So we switch, we preempt process one, we switch to our new process two. These are the two processes in the system now, and process two can continue to execute. And one time step later, process three arrives. Process three arrives here, but process three has the same absolute deadline as process two, so both have 24. So it doesn't gain priority, so it has to wait until process two actually does some I.O. So I.O. are the uh, reddish orange fields here and computation are the green fields here. So essentially only after process two has executed and finished its three unit CPU burst, then starts its I.O. burst, then process three can continue to run. And now process three has precedence over process one because 24, its deadline is of course still less than the deadline of process one. So now process three can execute and it executes undisturbed because there's no more processes coming in, can execute its uh, 10 units of compute time and then switch over to IO, for example, having an IO burst of four in this example. And then finally, process one can continue executing its remaining six units and then switching over to IO and then process two could take over again with the remaining time unit. All right, so uh, what we also have to show for EDF, like for uh, rate monotonic, is optimality. So for optimality for EDF, we want to show that EDF minimizes the maximum delay of tasks. So uh, this means if a schedule exists, which is able to keep all deadlines, then EDF also keeps all deadlines and in turn EDF is optimal for independent tasks with dynamic priorities. So that's our assumption. And especially for periodic tasks, we also know if the overall utilization is less or equal to one, then earliest deadline first always finds a valid schedule without missing deadlines. And we can also prove this if you're interested. We've given a literature reference down here. So what happens here is that the maximum delay of tasks should be minimized. So in this example here, task three would have no delay, task one would have a delay of one here, and finally task two would have this delay, two of three time units. And these delays are dependent on each other because if this delay happens here, then the other process have to wait, has to wait even more time units. So both delays here are dependent on each other. So this is not a real-time computing systems lecture, otherwise we would probably spend a couple of weeks on these algorithms. This should only give you a quick introduction here. So uh, what's our conclusion to EDF scheduling? We know it's optimal for periodic as well as aperiodic task sets. It can achieve a higher utilization than rate monotonic scheduling by using dynamic priorities. Uh, but of course, when we want to use it, we have to uh, remember that it's usually only implemented in special real-time operating systems. So we have to have an EDF-aware scheduler to guarantee EDF. No information about the number of duration of deadline misses can be obtained by the EDF schedule. That's unfortunate. And it's less predictable than, for example, rate monotonic scheduling. And one significant problem with EDF depending on your application, is that response times can vary significantly. So we can have jitter in uh, the response times of our processes here. And in overload situations, we can have a domino effect. So if one process is late, then the other process gets even later. And then maybe the next one gets later again, because we have one initial delay in our schedule. So uh, we can, of course, extend this.
Uh, so there's books and books written on real-time scheduling. There's uh, people doing nothing else than researching real-time scheduling algorithms. So of course it's possible to extend these strategies to work for more complex real-world systems. So you could work with sporadic tasks that have a limited arrival task but no strict period. So a task that can arrive because maybe a network packet comes in uh, at some point in time. Uh, we have explicitly said that we don't want to consider task dependencies. Of course, if you have task dependencies, you would need to have advanced algorithms that would be able to consider these. We want to maximize the CPU utilization. So, for example, you have uh, mixed critical systems today. and mixed critical systems, you have some tasks which are real-time critical and sometimes with, uh, tasks which are not real-time critical. So whenever you have already completed executing all your real-time tasks, you could use the remaining CPU time to execute any background tasks which are not timing critical. We could restrict this to so-called harmonic tasks, which means that periods are integer multiples of each other. Uh, so essentially we have some relations between the uh, periods of our uh, separate tasks, uh, which uh, yeah have uh, some, some influence on, on the uh, schedulability of our system. And finally, we might have modest changes in our system. For example, if something comes active in our system, we might uh, want to handle temporary overload in our system. And finally, of course, nowadays we have multiprocessor systems. So we might also want to be able to adapt our system to heterogeneous multiprocessor systems. As I said, these are all very complex things. This would require a whole semester of lectures in themselves. Uh, so this is just a short overview giving you uh, the insight that there are different ways to do scheduling than just for server or desktop computing systems. And these are important for large class of uh, systems because the number of embedded systems out there outnumbers the number of your servers and desktop systems by several orders of magnitude. So uh, ARM alone sells several billions of ARM CPUs mostly used in embedded systems every quarter. Okay. So that's all about real-time scheduling today, a bit more mathematical because real-time scheduling has to ensure formal properties of code, but we didn't go into too much detail, obviously. So if you're interested in more details, there's lots of literature out there. I can recommend uh, Peter Maivittel's book. There's a new edition, the fourth edition uh, that just came out, uh, Embedded System Design, Embedded System Foundations of Cyber Physical Systems. And the nice thing about it is we managed to make this book open access. So you can just download a PDF or uh, an EPUB file from the Springer website. And there's also additional papers and books which uh, are related to retime scheduling. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening and until next time. Bye.